Okay. And the next item of business is a debate on motion 3042 in the name of Jackie Bailey on cost of living. Um, as ever, I would invite members wish to participate to press the request to speak buttons or place an R in the chat function. And I call on Jackie Bailey to speak to and move the uh, motion around six minutes, please, Ms Bailey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Let me declare an interest at the start as an honorary Vice President of Energy Action Scotland. Today, Ofgem lifted the cap on energy prices again. The previous increase added £139 to bills. Now there will be an extra £700 more to pay. Energy bills have effectively doubled in the space of a few months. People on fixed incomes, people in insecure jobs, those on low pay, elderly people, all of them, plunged into debt or facing a choice between heating or eating. Fuel poverty currently sitting at 613,000 households could rise threefold to 1.8 million households in Scotland alone. And if that is not serious enough, Scots face increases across a range of other household bills, all at a time when incomes are stagnant and simply not keeping pace with these increases. This will devastate family finances as people stare down the barrel of a cost of living crisis. A cost of living crisis caused by inflation running at a 30 year high, caused by rises in interest rates, caused by rising national insurance, increasing by 10% in April, rising council tax, inflation busting rises in water rates, and massive rises in food bills that everybody sees on their supermarket shelves. There is no doubt about the scale of the crisis and the real struggle that Scots will face. So faced with the prospect of increasing poverty and warnings from organisations like Energy Action Scotland that some people will die as a consequence, it is incumbent on governments to act. And let me be clear, I expect both the Scottish and UK governments to set aside their customary differences and work together to protect people from the crisis. The Scottish Government have the power to help. Whether it's putting more income in people's pockets or reviewing some of the charges they are responsible for, doing nothing is not an option. The SNP amendment is therefore genuinely disappointing. Simply saying how much they are already doing is breathtakingly complacent when people are facing a doubling of their energy bills and a huge cost of living crisis. And let me give the government one example of how they can help. Water bills are set for an inflation-busting rise of almost 10%. Households will be paying hundreds of pounds more, and this at a time when Scottish water is sitting on at least £400 million in reserves, possibly as much as £700 million in reserves when you consider their subsidiary companies. Those reserves are taxpayers' money. But let's not forget the SNP tried to remove single person's discount from water bills a couple of years ago until they were rumbled. They were warned about the impact of these latest rises, but given a chance to do things differently, to actually help people, to be on their side, they stick their fingers in their ears and do nothing. And aside from reviewing the increased charges they are responsible for, the Scottish Government can increase the amount they give to help with heating. They have all the powers they need to do so, presiding officer. It simply requires political will. Yesterday, like many others, I watched in disbelief at the SNP's suggestion that we could cut the bottoms off school doors to help with ventilation. I kid you not, that Alice in Wonderland approach is what passes for policy thinking from the SNP. Next, perhaps they will be suggesting that we burn the cut-offs from those doors to heat our homes. Frankly, presiding officer, the people of Scotland deserve better than this. They deserve a government that is on their side, that does not use the constitution as an excuse for inaction, that protects their interests when times are tough. Let me turn to the Conservatives, and may I, as gently as I can, point out that the Tory amendment is not factually correct, because, of course, Rishi Sunak has actually frozen some personal allowances. But that aside, let me be the first to welcome anything that puts money in people's pockets. But to be frank, the Tories' approach is wholly inadequate. Giving energy companies loans simply lands bill payers with the cost at a later date. 
And with prices set to rise again in six months' time, this will do nothing to resolve the crisis. And the council tax rebate, worth about £150 per household, less than a quarter of what's required. Do you know, the big difference between us and the Tories and the SNP are joined at the hip on this issue, is that Labour would raise the money now through a windfall tax on the North Sea oil and gas profits, on the higher than expected VAT receipts and the higher than expected oil and gas revenues. For the SNP to join with the Tories to reject this and deny the Scottish people immediate help and support on the scale required is frankly shameful. They should hang their heads in shame. The SNP and the Tories have demonstrated whose side they're on. They're on the side of multinational oil companies making profits of £27,000 a minute. That's right, £27,000 a minute, more than some people earn in a year. And rather, rather than being on the side of hard-pressed Scots staring down the barrel of a cost-of-living crisis that is the worst in my memory. Under Labour's fully costed plans, every single Scottish household would get £200 towards the cost of their spiralling energy bills. For those 800,000 households that are the hardest hit, the support would be £600, and it applies to those both on and off grid. And in closing, presiding officer, let me finish with the £290 million in funding consequentials from the Scottish Government, sorry, for the Scottish Government, from the UK Government. Every single penny must go into the pockets of people who need urgent help. So will the SNP bring proposals before the Chamber next week to outline how it will distribute the money? This cannot wait. You must there conclude. can be no excuses, no inaction, no hiding behind the Constitution. They must act and act now in the interests of the people of Scotland. You do need to move the motion, please, Ms Bailey. And I move the motion in my name. Thank you for that. I now ask the Minister to speak to move Amendment 3042.2. Uh, five minutes, please, Mr. Uh, this is a very important and very timely debate as hundreds of thousands of families and households across Scotland are facing very challenging financial circumstances as a result of rising costs and high inflation. And as we've just seen reported in today's news, the Bank of England have said that UK households must now prepare for the biggest fall in living standards since records began on that issue three decades ago, and also prepare for the worst pay erosion since 1990. And of course, we've had Ofgem's announcement today that households are facing an eye-watering 54% increase in their energy bills, and that is indeed a real hammer blow to customers in Scotland and indeed throughout the UK. Analysis estimates that this price cap increase could move around 200,000 200, further households in Scotland alone into fuel poverty and around 235,000 235, who were already fuel poor who could move into extreme fuel poverty. Now, this, of course, sits within a wider context of increasing pressures on household costs. This is a cost of living crisis we're in, a crisis that calls for immediate action. From April, Workers and businesses across the country will have the added pressure of a rise in national insurance contributions, a policy which was announced without prior notice or consultation with the devolved administrations. And, of course, a hike which we're told is to pay for the NHS, despite the fact we were told that Brexit would deliver £350 million a week uh, towards the NHS. So we recognise the added need, of course, for health and social care funding, but the UK's decision to raise this by taxing workers rather than by wealth is a missed opportunity. And on top of that, of course, the Bank of England have announced that the interest rates will be raised by 0.5 per cent, the inflation will surpass 7 per cent, and that GDP forecasts will be slashed, leaving Scottish taxpayers to experience the worst living standard decline, as I said, of the last few decades. Powers relating to energy markets remain reserved for the UK Government, and I wish Jackie Bailey had borne that in mind when she was making her attack on the SNP and Green Governments. And as such, the UK Government must act urgently to address this crisis. The Cabinet Secretary for Net Zero Energy and Transport and the Cabinet Secretary for Social Justice have written more than once to re reiterate to the UK Government the need for urgent action, offering a series of proposals to support energy consumers, including through targeted direct support. And, of course, we await a response from the UK Government over and above what has been said today. The tax levers to help hard-pressed households are also reserved to the UK Government. These include the power to vary VAT rates 
on consumer bills in the short term. And I'm sorry to hear that the UK Government appear to have ruled that out today as well, again despite the fact that Boris Johnson said Brexit would give him the opportunity to cut VAT re rates. And the rates that apply to the provision of energy efficient materials and retrofitting of buildings uh, could also be cut, which contributes, of course, to long-term bills uh, being reduced. The Scottish Government has called for action on this and continues to do so, including by urging the UK Government to reconsider the decision not to enact a VAT reduction on energy bills. On our part, the Scottish Government is very, very much committed to supporting people in Scotland, especially those in low incomes. We are already using all powers and resources available to us to support people in this country, including through energy efficiency investment, Home Energy Scotland advice, support and housing costs with welfare and debt advice services, and the child winter heating assistance, and the Money Talks team service, which is now up and running, and support to address food insecurity as well. And in November, sure, yeah. Pam Duncan Glancy. Th th thank you, thank you, um, President Officer. And uh, thank you for taking the intervention. And I note the point that you say you're, you're doing what, what you can here, but there are a number of issues that have been raised, including with um, by Citizens Advice Scotland on the fuel poverty strategy that the Scottish Government has put forward. And they've said that it doesn't go far enough, that it isn't putting enough money in people's pockets. And things like the child winter heating assistant is only available to some people um, and families with some disabled children in them and not others. So will the Government address the poverty that those families experience by, by addressing the eligibility for that? Minister, I can give you some of that time back. Thank you. Well, as the First Minister said today, there's discussions going on with the UK Government over the consequentials from their announcements, and that that money will be earmarked to help those most affected. In terms of fuel poverty, of course, in November we put in place a £41 million winter support fund to ease the strain on low-income households, and that includes £10 million of funding available to help people struggling with their heating costs this winter. And our council tax reduction scheme currently supports over 470,000 households. In addition to that, by doubling the Scottish child payment to £20 per week, we anticipate that 40,000 children will be lifted out of poverty out of the 430,000 that are eligible for support. And we are carefully, as I've just said, assessing the mitigation measures the UK Government have announced today and how they will be applied in Scotland. But the £200 rebate that has been announced, which of course is basically to be paid back, it is just a loan and will not address the medium to long term issues, never mind the short term issues, is in the context of an increase in bills of nearly £700. So the £200 goes absolutely nowhere nearly uh, far enough. Uh, just as I draw to a close, Deputy Presiding Officer, I just want to say that uh, we should all take a moment to consider what it means to be forced to choose between heat and food in this day and age in this country. We are in the middle of a cost of living crisis. We are seeing hikes in tax, we are seeing the cost of Brexit, we are seeing income for universal credit recipients cut by the UK Government, and of course the list goes on and on and on. But yes, it is really important we do all work together to address what I said before is a very real uh, cost of living crisis being faced at the moment by the people of Scotland, and I move the Government's amendment. Thank you, Minister. I now call on Liz Smith to speak to move Amendment 3042.1 for four minutes, please, Ms Smith. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I move the amendment in my name? And can I also uh, acknowledge that this is a very serious issue for very many families who see their household bills only going in one direction, at the same time as they are obviously having to cope with all the other challenges of the pandemic, which is very far from over. And today, that anxiety will have been heightened with the news about the increase in the energy cap. And can I also acknowledge uh, concerns about the national insurance rise, which we'll come back to in a minute. Also acknowledge the anxieties about world markets and the increasing political tensions between Russia and the Ukraine, which potentially, obviously, have very serious implications for energy costs and supply chains. And drilling down on the detail of the inflation statistics, it is very clear that producers and suppliers involved in international trade are telling us that much of the current level of inflation is a direct result of rising shipping and wholesale gas costs, and listening to those involved in UK business also as a result of shortages in labour markets. We have inflation issues in other countries. Germany is now up to 4.9%, America to 7%, France to 3.3%, and there is obviously an underlying energy inflation in the Eurozone which is now averaging out at 28 per cent. Presiding officer, we know that the cost of the pandemic is well over £400 billion. We know that 6 million are on NHS waiting lists, and whether we like it or not, 
We need to go ahead with the national insurance increase to pay directly into the health and social care budgets. It is never popular to raise tax, and I am not going to argue that the national insurance increase will not be painful. But when the decision was made some time ago, there was a reluctant acceptance that to deal with the waiting lists and the NHS crisis, that rise was necessary. And while it is true that the living wage... Uh, yes, of course. I am grateful to the member for giving way, uh, and I understand that those who instinctively like low-tax policies will sometimes uh, you know, make an effort to come to terms with the, the need. Why is it the Conservatives are able to come to terms with the need for an NI hike, which will be regressive, but we're not able to come to terms with the need for more progressive income tax, which we've already implemented here in Scotland with a five-band system, which places the expectation on those with the broadest shoulders. Liz Smith, and I can give you that uh, time uh, back. Thank, thank Mr Harvey for that intervention, but it's all about uh, economic growth, which I know that his party is not terribly keen about. Um, but if you look at the Scottish Fiscal Commission's uh, statistics, there is a huge issue for Scotland when it comes to income tax uh, revenues, and that's one of the key issues uh, when it comes to income tax policy, and hence the Conservative Party's view on that. Now, I hear, too, uh, that uh, VAT on fuel bills should be scrapped, but that's not the best way of assisting those most in need, since it's not a progressive measure. Indeed, it would reduce bills by just 5 per cent, and it would cost the Treasury billions of pounds. And I've also heard claims, and we've had them uh, from Jackie Bailey uh, again this afternoon, that windfall taxes on oil and gas profits, similar to the uh, Gordon Brown windfall tax on privatised utilities in uh, 1997. But if we, look abroad to, uh, if we look abroad to other countries like Spain, for example, these have only had very limited success. The companies in question are owned by us all through pension funds, uh, can I just finish this point, Ms Bailey? The companies in question are owned by us all through pension funds and insurance firms, and they have to be attractive to new investment. Now, at, in terms of the uh, windfall taxes, that risks a reduction in output and therefore increasing prices for consumers. And we should not forget that £100 billion of investment is needed to secure future power generations. In short, the energy experts, Ms Bailey, are telling us that we need to increase energy supply and reduce the demand, and a windfall tax is going to do the opposite. I, am, I think you need to be winding up, Ms Smith, rather I, than taking interventions. I am very grateful. Ms Bailey, to, as briefly I would as be very, very quick. Would, would Liz Smith at least acknowledge that it was Margaret Thatcher who first put a windfall tax on oil and gas? And while acknowledging that or not, could you start winding up, please? <laughs> I can acknowledge very much uh, Gordon Brown's uh, failure on the windfall tax. And uh, on that point, actually, I'm very happy to, con to conclude my remarks. And, and move the amendment. I did at the start. Excellent. Alex Cole Hamilton, four minutes, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased to rise for my party to speak in favour of this incredibly important motion, which is impacting families up and down the country. And I'd like to thank Jackie Bailey for taking uh, time out of parliamentary uh, debating time for the Labour Party to bring it before us this afternoon. Presiding officer, you'd be hard-pressed at the moment to go more than a day or so without hearing about the rising costs of food and soaring fuel and energy prices. And we are, as we've heard many times this afternoon already, living through a cost-of-living crisis which is hitting families and individuals hard and from all directions. The Consumer Price Index showed that the cost of food and drink has been climbing every year and is up significantly when compared just with January 2020. The UK's biggest supermarket, Tesco, has already said its prices could be set to rise by 5%, and poverty campaigners have highlighted finding food items like rice and pasta, basic staples, having risen by as much as 340% in some locations. This is against a backdrop of skyrocketing energy costs. Indeed, just today, as we've heard several times again, the ONS regulator Ofgem has announced that the price cap will rise by £693 on average, causing bills of the average customer to rise up to uh, £1,971. It's worse for prepayment customers. That's not to mention the rising costs of fuel, rent and taxes. And all the while, wages stagnate. Inflation will this year reach its highest level in 30 years. And the painful reality is that those on the lowest incomes are feeling that impact most acutely. Presiding officer, all of this has taken its toll, and Citizens Advice Scotland has found that a third of Scots, a third of Scots, 
are worried about being able to pay for food and other essentials, which means that parents will be facing the anxiety of not being able to provide for their children. And some pensioners anxious about being unable to heat their homes. In this place, we have a sacred duty to recognise the challenges our constituents are facing and to act on their behalf to mitigate them. So I am pleased to support both the spirit and the proposals contained in Jackie Bailey's motion today, including on the Warm Homes discount, which my party have been calling for to be doubled and expanded to all of those in receipt of universal credit. Liberal Democrats also want to see the scrapping of the national insurance tax hike, saving families hundreds of pounds a year. Our plans also include forcing broadband providers to offer vulnerable customers cheaper deals through social tariffs, benefiting up to 8 million households and saving them up to £270 each every year. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government often talks a good game when it comes to tackling these issues, but when push comes to shove, they have been found wanting. With this latest budget, they will heap more misery with yet further cuts to local authorities, forcing council tax, uh, tax increases and cuts to the services that people most rely on, just when Scots are at their lowest financial ebb. My party recognises that the impacts of poverty and hunger can be wide-reaching. Studies have shown that they are major factors in preventing children from achieving their potential. We also support an enhanced carers allowance in Scotland and are calling for a UK-wide uplift of an immediate £1,000 per year. Presiding officer, in recounting her own story, journalist and poverty campaigner Jack Munro paints a very bleak picture of the choices far too many in our society are faced with. And I quote her words when I say, after you've cut back on everything else, food is the last to go. I didn't mind putting on an extra jumper if I had food in the fridge. It was at the point where I had an extra jumper on and no food in the fridge that I realized things had got terribly badly wrong. Presiding officer, in this day and age, no one, no one in this country should have to make such a choice, but with the cost of living crisis as we find it, all too many will. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to the open debate, and I call Paul Sweeney to be followed by Christine Graham. It is a great privilege to be able to contribute to today's debate on the cost of living crisis, which is undoubtedly the single most important issue facing millions of families across this country. With the announcement today from Ofgem that the energy price cap is set to rise by 54 per cent, meaning families could be hammered with an extra £700 on top of their existing energy bills, it is actually an emergency debate today that we have to consider, because, presiding officer, people are desperately worried. They are worried about their income, their job security and their ever-increasing bills that will suffocate and snuff out what little disposable income they have left. They are concerned about putting the heating on, about putting food on the table and about ensuring that they can keep a roof over their families' heads. And frankly, presiding officer, they are baffled at just how little people in positions of power are doing to help them through what is likely to be the worst cost of living crisis in living memory. While the lack of action from government at all levels is unforgivable, it is nothing when compared to deliberate, calculated actions like cutting the universal credit uplift at this time and placing ridiculous four-week deadlines for unemployed people to secure a job. That callousness will push millions into more poverty and destitution. In Glasgow alone, over 80,000 people are in receipt of universal credit. To put that into context, that number could have filled Celtic Park last night and still leave 20,000 people outside. We should be in no doubt. Families will suffer tremendous hardship because of that single decision. As someone with lived experience of being on universal credit, I find it sickening and cowardly that the richest man ever to have sat in the House of Commons, the Chancellor Rishi Sunak, thinks this is in some way acceptable. There are already one in four children in Scotland living in poverty. Are we really going to stand here and try to tell ourselves that these decisions won't make that intolerable situation worse? We know the price of energy is skyrocketing, but so too are other necessities. Just last week, the Daily Record reported an increase of nearly 20% on the price of a weekly food shop when compared to January of last year. Nationally, food and drink prices were 4.2% higher in the year to December 2021. So how do we fix it? Presiding officer, I have no doubt that we will hear the usual musings from the Conservative benches about a strong economy and low taxation stimulating growth while getting people into work being the best route out of poverty. But when you look at the reality 
rather than the rhetoric. It would be outrageous if it weren't so risible. We saw it yesterday in the Scottish rate resolution debate, where we continually heard Conservative MSPs talking about how Scotland is the highest taxed part of the UK, while simultaneously hiking national insurance, putting more pressure on hard-working families. Presiding officer, that hike in national insurance will raise an estimated £12 billion. But isn't it ironic that it won't even cover the £10 billion of PPE waste and the £4 billion of fraudulent applications for public funds that have been written off by the Treasury in recent weeks? Fundamentally, we need to be asking ourselves what we can do to help people right now. Labour's amendment today outlines what we believe would be an alleviation for some of the pressure on families. On energy costs, we would cut VAT for 12 months and would implement a windfall tax on companies with increased oil and gas profits, would offset virtually all of the increased energy price speculated for this year and help 9 million families across the UK. Yet the Chancellor has offered just £150 in October and £200 loan, which will not actually help at all because it has to be paid back. With Shell today reporting their highest quarterly profits in eight years, it seems like a small price for them to pay. This windfall tax would allow the government to save families around £200 on their energy costs alone. So we need to go much further on this, and I would really like to think that that approach is something that we could all support in this chamber as a baseline. I'm confident we all agree that we need to help people now. We cannot continue along the same track and pushing further people further into poverty because the government is simply too scared to put its money where its mouth is. Thank you. I call Christine Graham to be followed by Jamie Halker Johnston. Thank you, Presiding Officer. One issue not listed in the motion is the failure of successive UK governments in the management of the economy. This is of fundamental re relevance in a debate about the cost of living and those who will bear the brunt, many of whom are pensioners. I go back to Harold Wilson devaluing the pound in the 60s, to Tony Benn trashing alternative green energy, wave power in favour of nuclear, he later <laughs> recanted. As for oil and gas, the UK government sold it off cheap to international companies and only Shetland negotiated benefits for itself. Norway launched its own national company and now also leads in green energy. That oil off Scotland's shores was squandered by successive UK governments. Norway's sovereign wealth fund in 2020 was worth 923 billion. That's 170,000 pounds for every Norwegian and in the same year gained eight billion in value. That's some rainy day fund. The UK had no oil fund, zilt. The bank collapse in 2008 led to that creature, quantitative easing, otherwise known as printing money. That cash was supposed to trickle down to us, but flooded instead to those with substantial assets, the already wealthy. COVID comes along. The UK government has to write off over nine billion for useless PPE contracts, often divvied out to Tory pals, already borrowing, it has to borrow more, with the UK national debt now standing at over 100% of GDP. In other words, we are up to our ears in debt and it's increasing hourly with interest charges. Norway is the polar opposite. It doesn't have to borrow. It could ride out the bank's collapse, COVID, and even spiralling energy costs with a universal scheme to help consumers running now. It had the cash. Not like the Tory government, which is simply deferring some costs, which we shall pay for later. That's the context of squandering our assets and embedding inequalities in our society, where for decades the rich have got richer and the poor poorer. And that matters. Pensioner poverty is not new. Through a measly basic pension, women often working life has been interrupted by motherhood and caring responsibilities. They don't even receive that. A very short time. The pension credit system in my time here in 20 years has constantly failed with 40% entitled not claiming because of the complexities. Yet that pension credit opens the door to other benefits, which includes a free TV licence if you're over 75, but only if you're on pension credit. What a tawdry act that was to remove universal access during a pandemic with pensioners isolated in their homes. The hiking of energy costs impacts on those less mobile and confined to indoors, many of them pensioners. Food prices rising, all a nightmare for pensioners and fixed incomes and often more costly because they're often purchasing for one. Now, the Scottish Government has tried to mitigate, but 
I'm always disappointed in Labour because they seem to just go along with mitigating Tory policies. I want this to be radically reformed, and it can't be done in London. But here in Edinburgh, where we have the skills, the experience of my last minute, and the social democratic values to run the economy, not ruin the economy, to invest in all our natural resources and distribute through a fair tax system, which recognises that you judge, judge a nation by how it treats and respects its more vulnerable and elderly. And I say to Paul Sweeney, that means one thing and one thing only. Independence, just straightforward competence with Scotland's economy and a just distribution of our wealth. Thank you. I call Jamie Halcrow Johnston to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It might just be worth noting that um, Norway's national debt is forecast to be over $200 billion in 2026. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I appreciate Labour's use of their time today to debate a significant issue that should be at the top of the agenda of every member of this chamber. The cost of living is in one area where, which touches households across Scotland, and which I'm sure we've all been watching with concern over recent months, where all of us emerging from a pandemic unprecedented in its scope and reach, and we know all too well that our society is more fragile and less resilient than it once was. And while we should recognise the role that the UK furlough scheme has played in preventing some of the worst possible outcomes in terms of the impact on jobs and the economy, providing a level of stability for hundreds of thousands of families across Scotland, for many households, their budgets are already strained. This remains a particularly worrying time for families to be faced with a surge from energy bills and rising in other areas, rises in other areas too all while public services are stretched as never before. And as others have mentioned, the pronounced element of this has been a jolt in the cost of wholesale gas globally. We should not underestimate the reliance that we still have on gas. It heats the vast majority of British homes and it continues to provide a very significant proportion of our electricity, even while we move away from more polluting alternatives like coal. And we often speak of energy security, but the reality is that we are a net gas importer and remain at the whim of fluctuations on the global market. And sensible predictions suggest wholesale costs may remain high for the next two years. And these are undoubtedly major challenges, and although we can identify the problems, the solutions are less clear. The question of cutting VAT on home energy bills is a finely balanced one, which, when compared with other interventions, uh, for the, sorry, when compared with other interventions, and as Liz Smith highlighted last month, the IFS noted that such a policy would give average households back less than a fifth of the annual increase in costs and could bring with it unintended consequences. This is... Yes. Jackie Bailey. Does he not recall, as I recall, that Boris Johnson promised he would do this? Jamie Halker johnston I, I do, and this, I'm just going to come to that, actually. This is, of course, not a conclusive argument against it. And the Chancellor today announced proposals to smooth price fluctuations over longer time periods. And I note that approach, approaches like this were addressed in Labour motions. On a wider scale, sadly, little progress has been made towards diversifying domestic heating supplies. We're still scratching the surface of moving homes from fossil fuel dependence to renewable heat. And in my own region, the Highlands and Islands, we've long faced its own issues around high costs of fuel. We have a considerably higher than average number of properties not connected to the mains gas and so reliant on oil and LGP, LPG tanks or electricity at higher cost. And those households, households already spending a larger proportion of their incomes on energy, whether through low income or higher energy costs, will be hardest hit by this cost increase. And for those in this position, particularly many in the Northern Isles, where fuel poverty rates are higher, it is particularly galling to be surrounded by wind, wind turbines, but seeing no benefit in their bills. While we consider those that will be hardest hit by energy costs, we should also look at other areas. The Scottish Government's budget for next year is currently going through this Parliament. Earlier today, I was able to question the Public Finance Minister on the Government's approach to the Local Government Financial Settlement. And while Ministers have yet again been busy patting themselves on the back for reducing the levels of their cuts to already stretched Council finances, there is still the likelihood that many local authorities will try and address this cut with, somewhat, with Council tax rises in order to keep services running. Higher costs have also hit transport at all levels. This is another area where the Highlands and Islands, like many more remote and rural parts of Scotland, will feel the pinch. And of course, where pub local public transport, like bus routes, are lost, people are forced to drive with all the additional costs that that incurs. And on the issue of, of an issue of particular relevance in my region, 
At the end of last year, the Scottish Government decided that inter-island ferries would not be covered by the Young Persons Travel Scheme. Could I ask Me you to conclude, please? I will do. Meaning that while a person on the mainland could travel from Berwickshire to Caithness for free, a young person in Orkney or Shetland, whether travelling for education or for work, will still be liable for any ferry fares, which might make part of their journey. I'll, I'll have to um, ask you to conclude there, Mr Halker Johnson. We're very tight for time this afternoon. Um, can I call Stuart Macmillan to be followed by Maggie Chapman? Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. First of all, I'd like to thank the Labour Party for bringing this debate forward. And it's worth reminding the Chamber and Scotland uh, of the former Labour Chancellor Alistair Darling's comments that his cuts would have been deeper and tougher than Thatcher's. Uh, we can't let the population forget that austerity actually started under Labour, but it has been turbocharged. It has been turbocharged by the Tories since uh, they've been in power, particularly when uh, they're in power with the, the Liberal Democrats with the Cameron Clegg coalition. But the debate is timely with the announcement of the energy price cap increasing by £693 for direct debit customers and by £708 for prepaid meter customers. Many people in the prepaid meters have them for a reason, and many of these customers are some of the lowest paid in society. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation analysis warns that the energy price cap rise will devastate the UK's poorest families, who will spend an average 18 per cent of their income after housing costs on energy bills after April. Uh, National Energy Action, a UK charity, estimates that 6 million UK households will be living in fuel poverty by April, a 50 per cent increase from 2021. That's a 50 per cent increase from 2021. The announcement by the Tory government today of a £200 loan and £150 for, council tax, for some council taxpayers in England at first glance doesn't go anywhere near enough to actually help the many who are already struggling and uh, are really having to choose between heating or eating. As we know, energy costs are going up, fuel costs are going up, food prices are going up, clothing costs are going up, and the national insurance costs are going up. So whilst the Tories are in Westminster, are busy getting bevied in their suitcases of booze and Boris's gaff, in addition to Liz Truss spending half a million, spending half a million pounds on a flight to Australia, many people, across, many people across the UK are struggling to survive. I will take the intervention. Jamie Halker Johnston. I thank the member for taking the intervention. Um, with the announcement this morning, there will likely to be Barnet consequentials. Can I ask him where he thinks those should be spent by the Scottish Government? Yeah. Stuart McMillan. Well, first of all, I think we all, have to see, we all have to see what the details of those actually are. But we did hear what the First Minister said. I don't know if the member was listening to the First Minister's questions, but that question was answered by the First Minister. Certainly for the people of, Eng for the people of England, they also have the additional prescription charges at £9.35 a time and paying for the tuition fees. Clearly, the out-of-touch Tories care little about the cost of living crisis and more about saving their own skins at the next UK general election. Inflation is sitting at 5.4%. The highest it's been for 30 years, and some economists are expecting it to hit 7% this year. Thing also, the UK already has the worst levels of poverty and inequality in North West Europe, and the highest levels of in-work poverty this century. A report, a report by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, a report by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation shows that around two-thirds, 68%, of working-age adults in poverty in the UK live in a household where at least one adult is in work. This figure has never, ever been higher. Now, I actually do believe that, I do believe that work is a route out of poverty. However, however when somebody is in work and they are actually getting on poverty pay, how can they get themselves out of poverty? And this is something that the Tories really don't, uh, do not understand. Using, OECD, using the OECD data uh, shows that the UK poverty rates have been worse in nearly every year of the 21st century, compared to nearly every neighbouring country of the UK and North West Europe. The pandemic has played a part in these rising costs, but so too has been Brexit. The chaos and confusion caused by Boris and his Brexiteers at the expense of the normal person in our communities is therefore all to see. The OBR, um, I am concluding, the OBR uh, estimated this year that only two-fifths two -fifths of the Brexit damage has been inflicted so far, with every person facing a cost of £1,200. And with that, presenting officer, I will conclude, but I will be backing the amendment in the name of the Scottish Government. Thank you. I call Maggie Chapman to be followed by Paul O'Kane. Thank you. Scottish households are facing profound financial challenges. We must address these directly, demanding accountability from where decision-making power on energy lies 
and seek to tackle the foundational causes of inequality while acknowledging why we are in this position. The, the crisis is a product of several factors. We have a UK government that is taking more and giving less, as we've seen in their decisions on national insurance and universal credit. This pushes many into fuel and food poverty and stifles our businesses. Westminster has failed oil and gas workers, failed energy customers, and further destabilised our climate by its refusal to support shifts away from volatile fossil fuel markets. And it's wasted our money in the process too, like the £400 million spent on the abandoned Green Deal scheme that only supported 1% of households and delivered significantly fewer measures than any previous scheme. Their withdrawal of support for renewables, especially onshore wind, and comprehensive insulation schemes should be a cause of shame. So here we must do everything in our power to minimise the impacts of this crisis on Scottish homes and livelihoods by disinvesting scarce public money from unsustainable industries and greenwashing initiatives. We must not prolong the extraction of fossil fuels whilst ignoring the fact that big oil and gas companies shift the detriments of market volatility onto workers. Instead, we have the potential to demonstrate how the just transition to local energy systems as part of a Green New Deal can reduce poverty and inequality. But, unfortunately, these innovations, which would see significant revenue generation we could use to support households and businesses whilst reducing costs of domestic energy use, are still restricted by the UK government's socially and environmentally regressive policy regime. We also need to make sure that we, support, that we use the support that is available and ensure that that support, like the Scottish Welfare Fund, is accessible as possible, as Citizens Advice Scotland and others have highlighted. It is clear that Scotland is moving toward a more distributive fiscal policy, as we see in our decision to make bus travel free for young people, the doubling of the child payment, and so on. The actions we see from Westminster will only allow the gap between rich and poor to grow. South of the border, where big decisions about Scotland's energy systems are made, home insulation schemes are failing without consequence. 90% of energy bill increase in the last year has been due to the rising price of gas. The only way of cutting the cost of energy is ending our dependence on gas and breaking the relationship between gas prices and fuel bills. But Westminster refuses to do this. This reflects the general failures of Westminster to protect vulnerable homes and livelihoods from predatory and exploitative business practices and from its own defective fiscal policy. And all of this happens as COVID-19 and its impacts continue to weigh heavy on many Scots who lost income and loved ones. The Scottish Government's resource spending review must mitigate this crisis rather than exacerbating it in any way. This will, of course, involve trade-offs. Scotland's fiscal constraints demand such trade-offs. But the most vulnerable in our society deserve, at the very least, for public money to be spent in a way that delivers sustainable and affordable outcomes for them. There has been consistent denial from Westminster when we demand accountability for this crippling cost of living crisis. Let us not forget David Cameron's desire to, and I quote, get rid of all the green crap. This has added two and a half billion pounds. Yes, that's two and a half billion pounds to UK energy bills. It seems that Westminster only cares about things that make massive profits for their pals. Denials and disinterest won't help anyone. We need a concerted and palpable intervention. If the UK government is incapable of or unwilling to meet the urgent needs of households and businesses in Scotland, it must give us the powers we need to deliver these interventions ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. I call Paul O'Kane to be followed by Finlay Carson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I rise in support of the motion in Jackie Bailey's name. All across Scotland, people are feeling the growing strain of the cost of living going up. People are facing unthinkable choices, and it is clear that people's physical and mental health is deteriorating as a result. And this is a consequence of a perfect storm of different factors, from the rises in taxation to the increase in food prices. The sad reality of this is that the situation is only set to worsen, with some analysts pointing to inflation reaching beyond 6%. And further to this, we know that the true cost of inflation will be even higher for those who have the least already. In response, what people in Scotland need is their two governments standing up for people. But what they have is their governments letting them down. Whilst I accept that the growing cost of gas is a global issue, 
In Scotland, we are experiencing the consequences of over 10 years of the Conservatives' failed energy policy, which has left us uniquely exposed. The Tories failed to properly regulate our energy market, leading to dozens of energy companies going bust, uh, and with all of us having to foot the bill. The dithering and the incompetence has created an energy price crisis being felt by everyone. However, the blame for the rise in costs in energy is not squarely at the foot of the Tories. The SNP's record on energy is also one of U-turns and a failure to deliver. They have failed on the delivery of a public energy company and failed to harness Scotland's renewables potential. And now they have sold off on the cheap the right to profit from Scotland's energy transition to multinational corporations with dubious human rights records. The people of Scotland should know that this crisis happened on the watch of both governments with the Tories. I'd like to make some progress. Um, on the watch of both governments, with the Tories and SNP having failed to meet the vast potential of Scottish and British renewables and other forms of energy. The SNP has also presided over the development of a low-wage economy in Scotland, which means Scottish households are more exposed to the cost of living crisis. But many of the factors driving Scotland's labour shortages and low growth in wages predated the pandemic and have gone unaddressed by the SNP for years. And as if to add insult to injury, the rise in prices is also seen in the growing cost of public transport, with the increase in the cost of tickets on ScotRail. It's just another example of continued mismanagement of our country's transport, which is adding to the cost of living for hard-working people. What all of this undoubtedly paints is an incredibly bleak picture for Scots all over the country, with failures across both of our governments. But it doesn't have to be this way. There are solutions to alleviate the pain of this crisis. Both here, in this place, uh, and at the UK level, Labour have a plan to make life easier for people. To address the immediate crisis, Labour would bring in fully funded measures, now to reduce the expected price rise in April, saving most households around £200 or more. And Labour have called for a cut to VAT on domestic energy bills for 12 months from April 22, saving an average household around £89. And with the one-off windfall tax on increased oil and gas profits, that could be achieved. And we on these benches, which I'm in my final minute, and we on these benches would use the power of this Parliament to top up winter fuel payments. That is a choice that we would make. So, Presiding Officer, the situation is stark. Charities, advice and rights organisations, and now our churches and religious groups are pointing out the devastating impact of hikes in energy prices and the cost of living on the poorest in our society. Indeed, just today, I read the Catholic Parliamentary Office making a statement saying that these things aren't luxuries. They are the very basic, decent things that someone should expect in their life. So it is clear, presiding officer, that the Tories and the SNP have failed people across this country, and it is Labour who are the real alternatives and who have the ideas to address this crisis. Thank you. Thank you. I call Finlay Carson to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, presiding officer. Like everybody in this chamber, I know only too well that the growing number of people are feeling the financial pinch as household bills continue to rise. As we have already heard, the food prices are rising fast as indeed our energy costs. In today's announcement by Ofgem that the energy price cap will increase from the 1st of April for approximately 22 million customers, resulting in an increase of bills in around £700, is very concerning. But the Chancellor today has, however, announced a £9 billion package of support which will ease the pain. Some of this support will be available in Scotland, somewhere in the region of £290 million, and I would urge the Scottish Government to use every single penny to address this ISIS. Crisis. Um, compounding things, many households are also fearing huge hikes in their council tax bills as a direct result of the insufficient funding by the Scottish Government and the Scottish Budget. And while the cost of living hikes affect everyone, I want to highlight the plight of those living in rural communities like mine in my constituency of Galloway and Western Fries. People in rural and remote communities were among the hardest hit through no fault of their own, but often as a result of policies that this Scottish Government have, uh, have taken, failing to address or even appreciate the challenges of living in rural areas. Many Scottish households are also fearing um, they have also uh, experienced a uh, low wage economy, like in Dumfries and Galloway, uh, where many are employed in agriculture, forestry or the hospitality sector. And there is a growing number also working in the food and drink and retail industry, which historically has not attracted good wages. Against this, food prices in local villages and community shops are considerably higher than you would pay for the same items in supermarkets and towns and cities. And I can stress at this point, this is certainly not a criticism of small rural retail businesses, 
provide a lifeline service and often in difficult circumstances where they're trying to make a living for themselves and they strive to keep their shelves well stocked with the widest range of goods. More often or not, elderly residents and young families have no choice and have to rely on rural stores, inevitably having to pay prices more than the goods uh, that their urban cousins are having to pay. And some rural shops, including one in Polnacki in my constituency, were told by one national wholesaler that they need to spend £1,000 to have stock delivered, which is a very worrying move and could force many out of business. The wholesaler said they had to enforce this policy because of higher fuel costs, smaller margins of money, many retail goods, and fear it would lose money on deliveries. So it's a vicious circle. I'm afraid I'll have to carry on. Um, rural communities are penalised by poor public transport links, something that the SNP have failed to address in their 15 years in power. And, and more often than not, elderly residents... The SNP are also... We're also seeing uh, fare hikes and service cuts to the railway services in Galloway. But many rely on public buses to either go to the shops or work in nearby towns. But even if we, as we emerge from the pandemic, we are still seeing inadequate services. And many under-22s in my region will look on in envy as their urban cousins enjoy free bus travel, while the youngest in my constituency would simply like to see a bus. This policy simply widens the rural and urban gap. Where was the rural, rural proofing in that policy? Even those fortunate to have a car, despite the welcome freeze on fuel duties, are hard hit at the pumps as prices in rural garages are considerably higher than the four coats in towns and cities. So people living in rural and remote communities are paying a hefty price just to keep going, whether it's food or for the, whether it's fuel, and even broadband services, and many don't have it because of the disastrous uh, R100 rollout, but they often have to look at more expensive packages just to get a consistent, consistent connection. Rural fuel poverty is, of course, one of the biggest problems. Energy Action Scotland has already highlighted the particular difficulties faced by um, uh, um, fuel, uh, rural fuel in uh, rural areas, and the higher fuel costs, the lack of access to mains gas grid, and higher premiums on heating oil and gas, uh, which is delivered uh, remotely, and the challenging household st uh, stock that we've got. Uh, and there's also a difficulty. Please conclude, in, Mr. Carson. Well, it's scandalous. Uh, presiding officer, that consumers in rural areas uh, uh, often pay higher gas uh, prices than for the same product in, in rural areas. Energy efficiency we'll support needs to, to be delivered. to conclude there, Mr Carson. Thank you. I call Kenneth Gibson, who is the final speaker in the open debate. Thank you, presiding officer. And what we got out of that is that the Tories are clearly opposed to free bus passes for people under the age of 22. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. Uh, the cost of living crisis is happening amidst a backdrop of supply chain disruption during the pandemic and compounded by UK policies such as Brexit and the short-sighted closure of gas storage facilities, which of course began under the last Labour government, making the UK more vulnerable to volatile uh, gas price rises. The energy price cap we now know, in a decision rushed out this morning, um, I will accept a, an intervention from Mr Stephen Kerr. Kerr. The vulnerability that Kenny Gibson <coughs> speaks of, is that enhanced in any way by the attitude of your party towards nuclear, towards the investment possibilities for communities in Scotland where nuclear power has been a main feature of the local economy? Kenneth Gibson. Yeah, jump going from the, the utter failure of the Conservative government to have enough storage facilities for gas to talk about the future of the nuclear industry, to be honest. A nuclear industry which, if we went along with the, the costs of Hinkley Point, would increase energy prices dramatically compared to what people are paying just now. You may shake your head, Mr Kerr, but your inability to accept and face up to the facts it, it, it says more about you than it actually does about the issue we're debating. So the energy price cap, as we now know, and the decision rushed out this morning to further deflect from the Prime Minister's myriad travails, will rise from an average of £1,277 to £1,970, a 54% rise, or taking into account the £135 rise uh, from £1,142 in the autumn, a 72.5% jump in a single year. Huge numbers of people will find themselves plunged into fuel poverty as household incomes fail to keep up with inflation through wage rises and the Tory decision to abandon their own manifesto commitment to the triple lock, which will cause severe hardship to our pensioners already amongst the poorest in Europe relative to earnings. And it's very disheartening that many families now face uh, the, the, the problem of increasing debt, with demand for credit card uh, lending jumping by 41.5% in the last 
uh, few months of 2021 while demand for other unsecured credit and buy now pay later products rose by 37.5 per cent highlighting the desperate situation many families are in and now when Christine Graham was speaking and talking about Norway I seem to uh, recall uh, Jamie Halcrow Johnson talking about the debt of uh, Norway so I had a wee look at it 42 per cent of GDP in Norway 105 per cent in the UK Jamie so I don't think you want to get down that road the Joseph Roundtree Foundation said that the forthcoming national insurance hike adds insult to injury for low-income households, including two, million, <laughs> including two million already reeling from the £10.40 a year uh, ending of the universal credit uplift. Meanwhile, inflation continues to rise and has now climbed higher than the Eurozone the Tories were so desperate to abandon. Over the last eight years, the Scottish Government has spent over a billion pounds tackling fuel poverty. However, for as long as energy pricing and obligations are reserved to the UK Government, Scotland will continue having to allocate substantial amounts of the already restricted budgets to mitigating the effects of harsh Tory policies, such as, the, such as uh, having to introduce the £41 million winter support fund uh, and, of course, having to implement progressive policies to benefit low-paid families. And, of course, low-paid families, uh, the SNP, uh, unlike some people in the Labour Party, care, we care deeply about. So, uh, Rachel Reeves MP, the Shadow Chancellor, told The Guardian, and I quote, we don't to be seen and we are not the party to represent those who are out of work. But the SNP believes that everyone should be represented. We believe we should have the powers in this parliament to be able to assist everyone. And in terms of oil windfall uh, uh, taxes, uh, what happened the last time there was a windfall tax? There was a 10-year drop in investment, actually costing uh, myriad jobs to the Scottish and indeed UK economies. Labour just sees this as a cash cow. And of course, this matter was previously debated uh, uh, just uh, last week. Why not look at excessive profit of all companies, why just oil and gas, as the First Minister suggested, we should, we should actually to conclude, Mr. Gibson. a wee bit. Um, and just one last thing I'll say in conclusion, uh, President Officer, because I did take a, a, a to intervention there, was that uh, under Labour's watch, oil prices rose from Ms. $12 Mr. Gibson, to near $100 a Mr. barrel. Gibson, what did they do with Mr. that Mr Gibson, it's your choice whether or not you take an intervention. It doesn't mean that you can continue beyond time. Thank you. We now move to winding up speeches, and I call Douglas Lumsden to be followed by Patrick Harvey. Uh, thank you, President Norton. And I remind members of my register of interest that it shows I'm still a councillor at Aberdeen City Council. Um, I think it's been an interesting debate today. Um, I note a very similar debate happened in the House of Commons this week, but a, a very similar motion from, from Labour there. Uh, I want to focus my initial remarks on the Labour motion to implement a windfall tax on the oil and gas industry. And it's sad to see Labour so disconnected now from the North East. From our significant history in the city of Aberdeen, they now seem to have turned their backs on the region, yep. just like the SNP have. Yeah. They are now completely disconnected from the energy industry and their workers. And a windfall tax on this industry would most severely impact those workers. We cannot simply change a tax regime with a flick of a pen. It's unfair on our industries and causes instability and uncertainty in the marketplace. When investment is under threat, those companies fail to create jobs and invest in the North East. And it's my constituents who will suffer. It's the 100,000 Scots who are directly employed by the energy sector that will suffer. And how their cost of living will be affected when they have uncertainty about their employment. The SNP Green Coalition are threatening the jobs in the North East, and now the Labour Party have joined in and are doing the same. My colleague Andrew Bowie made the point in the House of Commons that this week that oil and gas prices fluctuate wildly. Gas may be sitting at near record prices today and oil may be sitting at $88 a barrel right now, but tomorrow that might all change. Yep. It's grossly incompetent, naive, inept and totally ignorant to base a policy around the price of oil and gas. Mm -hmm. And he's absolutely correct. Yep. But turning to other matters, the cost of living crisis that we face is probably the biggest issue that we have to deal with as we recover from the pandemic. The SNP Green Amendment is nothing if not predictable, taking no responsibility and offering nothing new. Give us more powers, it says. Well, you don't need more powers to fund local government correctly. You just need to value them and treat them as, as partners. Because as Finlay Carson points out, you know, there's a huge risk of increased council tax bill due to the real terms cut in £251 million to local government. This will be a real burden to families right across Scotland and that is entirely the fault of this devolved government. 
And I hope that this devolved government will pass on all the consequentials in full from the announcement today by the UK Government to reduce council tax bills in England to our local authorities. And you don't need more powers to invest in our future workforce and give them the skills to have a well-paid job and improve our economy's productivity. More and increased taxes are not going to solve this cost of living crisis. Increases to the living wage, raising the personal allowance, reducing unemployment, creating well-paid jobs will. And we've heard today that the UK Government are taking action. Um, the Scottish Government need to take action also, and that was something that Jackie Bailey pointed out in her contribution. We've heard some other interesting contributions uh, today. We've heard from um, Christine Graham, who we said there was no debt in Norway, but that's been since pointed out, uh, was corrected by uh, Kenny Gibson. And uh, once again, we've, we've somehow seen from the SNP moving a cost of living debate onto uh, back to independence. Um, well, I've got news for Christine Graham. If she thinks things are bad now, independence would bring austerity max, and that would affect our poorest in society. We've also heard from Stuart McMillan break, bringing up the uh, Spended, be it spending being wasted. Well, you know, 700,000 being spent on civil service planning for an independence referendum, that is money that's wasted. And what about the rusting ferries that were painted on windows? Surely that's another huge waste of money. In conclusion, President Officer, I support the amendment put forward by Liz Smith to build an economy, increase employment, support the North East, and recover from this pandemic. Thank you. I call Patrick Harvey. Up to four minutes, Minister. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Well, the, there are clearly uh, a, a wide range of issues uh, that members are disagreeing about, but I hope the one thing we can agree about is that Labour colleagues are quite right to bring this topic uh, to the Chamber in some of their debate time. It is, as many members across the Chamber have recognised, uh, the crisis of our, uh, uh, of our age at the moment. The, the cost of living crisis is going to be profound. It is growing already. It is likely to continue to grow uh, and it will impact people in critically important ways and on a huge scale. Jackie Bailey uh, opened the debate by saying that she seeks action from both governments. We agree. Uh, she said that she doesn't want a government that, puts, uh, that uses the constitution as an excuse not to act. Well, I support independence, but I agree. I wouldn't want to be part of a government that uses that as an excuse not to act. And she, and she says uh, that blaming the UK government isn't uh, enough, while acknowledging that they have responsibility for a wide range of issues. And we agree. But she then seemed to object to the fact that the government amendment does set out the wide range of actions that we are taking with devolved powers. The cost of living crisis relates to energy, of course, uh, and in particular, that's particularly sharp at the moment, but it's about far more than energy. And the Scottish Government is investing, not only investing, but giving the clear uh, confidence uh, in the future that we will be regulating to ensure uh, greater investment in energy efficiency, in reducing demand for energy. And given that the, the spike in wholesale gas prices uh, are the dominant factor right now, clearly reducing our energy consumption has to be a critical part. Uh, I, I saw Liz Smith first. I'll try if there's time later. Liz Smith. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful to Mr Harvey. What confidence does he believe that the Scottish Green Government is giving to workers in the north-east of Scotland? Minister. I've spoken to many uh, workers in the north-east north of Scotland who recognise that fossil fuels are not the future of their communities or of our economy or of our planet, and they want a government that will invest in the just transition, which is what we're, which is what we're doing. If we're going to achieve the, the, the reduction in people's energy costs, energy efficiency, demand reduction and zero emissions heating has to be a part of it. But it's about far more than energy. Uh, we have the Scottish child payment introduced, then expanded, then doubled, uh, contrasting with the UK cut to universal credit. We have uh, investment in making sure that we have free school meals, uh, not burdening young people with the cost of tuition for higher education, free prescriptions, etc. 
uh, and other measures to cut the cost of the school day, as well as increasing funded childcare. We have lower council tax uh, in Scotland than elsewhere in the UK, plus a council tax reduction scheme. And we spend significant amounts of money from the Scottish Government uh, budget to mitigate the harmful, deeply harmful uh, impacts of UK social security policies. If Jackie Bailey still wants to come in, I'll give way at this point. Jackie Bailey. Thank you. Um, the amendment from the SNP Government actually will provide very cold comfort but for people who are struggling now. The, the Minister is in danger of missing the point. It's not what you've done before, it's what extra you're going to do now because people are in a worse position and they're looking to both government, governments to help them out. Minister. Thank you. And uh, we have a, a great deal more to come, as well as the introduction of a free bus for, for under-22s, which has only just come in, and which, yes, will protect routes uh, that are vulnerable in rural areas, vulnerable to cuts by private market operators. We, we will be implementing the Fair Fares Review uh, to look at rebalancing the costs uh, of getting about. We will be introducing rent controls, as well as protection against evictions during the costly winter months. Uh, and indeed, uh, we have a commitment to the progressive taxation system that we have in Scotland, contrasting with only just yesterday, again, uh, calls uh, for tax cuts for high earners uh, coming from Conservative colleagues. Uh, Presiding officer, in, in, in closing, there is a great deal that we also need the UK government uh, to do. Uh, we, we have a clear focus uh, on making sure that we will take every action we can with devolved powers, uh, and the just transition away from fossil fuels has to be critical uh, in achieving Thank you, that. Minister. This government is committed to taking that action with Thank every you. lever that we have at our disposal. Thank you. I call on Pam Duncan Glancy to wind up the debate and up to five minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'll try to address much of um, some of what I've heard today in, in my closing remarks. The cost of living crisis is not just a concept, it is a reality for too many people who are becoming increasingly unable to make ends meet, not able to afford rent, travel, food, energy, clothes, the basic components of achieving a decent standard of living. And as my colleague Paul Sweeney has noted, this is an emergency. We have known for some time that without further action and fast, this government will fall short of the child poverty targets this Parliament set in law. And we must acknowledge that while the overarching levels of poverty among children are far too high in general, they are even higher among the six priority groups that the Scottish Government has itself identified. Those in lone parent families, in a household where someone is disabled, those families um, that have three or more children or are under one, young mothers and black minority ethnic families. But it's not just poverty among children that we must look at either. I could fill a day talking about the poverty and inequality facing unpaid carers and the disproportionate impacts unpaid work, the pandemic and the gender pay gap have on the ability of women and their families to escape poverty and meet the cost of living crisis. But given my limited time today, I'll refer members to the previous speeches I've made from this chamber. The poverty and inequality that is being further exacerbated that the, uh, by the cost of fuel and food continues to rise, meaning bills that people were already struggling to pay are increasing even further. And no one should be facing the choice of choosing between heating their homes or putting food on the table. And on this point, I agree with my colleague Stuart McMillan. However, I would like to gently suggest that if he is committed to ending in work poverty, that he start by using the powers of this Parliament to address the fact that 61% of children in poverty are living in working households. Our motion today asks the Scottish Government to support the measures announced by the Labour Party and that would offer protection from the energy hikes announced today, which would save almost to most households £200. We would also target extra support to the squeezed middle and low income families, including pensioners, to take £600 off their bills. We asked SNP MPs to support our policy proposals through a one off windfall tax, and they refused. Yet this morning, the First Minister said that she did support calls on windfall tax. So I wonder why our MPs refused to vote at all. Presiding Officer, Richard Lockhead noted earlier that some of his, this is, of course, reserved. And he's right. So I looked to the SNP and Green Benches and I asked, why are people in Scotland sending your colleagues to Westminster only for them not to vote on such a significant issue that would improve the lives of people in Scotland? No matter what your views are on the Westminster Parliament, the reality is that right now you're sending SNP MPs to the House of Commons on behalf of the people of Scotland and people expect them to make decisions in their best interests and SNP MPs across this country have failed to do that duty this week.
At every general election, your party stands on a platform that says you are stronger for Scotland. And this week, you refused to vote for a policy your First Minister said today she would support. And we cannot afford to let this Tory government off the hook like that. We must use every vote we have there and all the people power in that room to hold them to account. And we want to give security for families in the short term by keeping bills down, not for luxuries, but for, as my colleague Paul O'Kane has said, essentials. But we also want to offer security in the long term. People are falling from one crisis to the next in Scotland, and we see that in the repeat applications to the Scottish Welfare Fund. The SNP's solution to this cost of living crisis has been to offer stop gaps, one off handouts, and little bits of support. When it comes to long term systemic change, it's just not willing to take the action that's needed. They're saying that you can solve today's crisis with yesterday's policies, and the situation has moved on. And the Tories' response, of course, has been to end the essential universal credit, and so we can't trust them either. Tackling this cost of living crisis must come hand in hand with action to address structural inequality and poverty. And the UK government can't be trusted on this or, or much else right now. They protect their own time and again, time and again, but the Scottish Government aren't doing nearly enough here in Scotland either. They have the means and the power to do it, but they're lacking the motivation. Presiding officer, I ask the Government have some humility, recognise your own failings and challenge, and I must afraid, I'm afraid challenge Christine Graham on two things you said. The notion of economic competence, and I'd urge Christine Graham to look at the black hole in the Fiscal Commission's forecasts on Social Security and their downward revision of the tax take due to the Scottish Government's failure to create jobs and building of a low-wage economy here in Scotland. And secondly, I'd also suggest that Scot suggesting that Scottish Labour mitigate Tory policy. I make no apologies for wanting to use all the powers of this Parliament to protect the people in Scotland. But we don't just have aspirations to mitigate bad Tory decisions. We aspire to replace them and make better ones. The Poverty and Inequality Commission this week, a body governed by the government itself and the JRF and anti-poverty organisations, have all warned that they need to do more. It cannot go on ignoring them. You must, the government must take action now to reduce housing costs by controlling rents, insulating homes, saving families ongoing heating costs, regulate bus companies to ensure fares are affordable, freeze rail fares. You could make sure work pays by using all the powers of procurement and end zero hours contracts, conclude. secure a living wage for those in the public sector and, of course, pay social care workers £15 an hour. Please conclude, Ms Duncan Glancy. Under the SNP, poverty has continued to rise, and I would like to remind Mr Gibson that this is in contrast to the fact that under a Labour government, under Labour Party's watch, Thank things you. were you very, very conclude. different. Thank I support you. the motion in Jackie Bailey's name. That concludes the debate on the cost of living. There will be a brief pause before the next item of business.